Let's first wrap our heads around the sheer scale of this achievement. Zanaru's quantum computer, which they've beautifully named Aurora, has officially achieved something called quantum supremacy. This is a heavyweight title in the world of computing. It means a quantum machine has performed the specific, highly complex task that no classical computer, no matter how powerful, could feasibly complete in a human lifetime. The task was a mathematical beast called Gaussian boson sampling. Now, you don't need to be a mathematician to understand the implications. The important part is the time difference. 108 seconds for Aurora versus an estimated 7 million years for the Fugaku supercomputer, the reigning champion of classical machines. 7 million years. Let that number sink in. If you had started that computation when our earliest human ancestors, the Homo habilis, were first chipping away at stones to make primitive tools, you would still be waiting for the answer today. All of human history, the rise and fall of empires, the invention of agriculture, the Renaissance, the Industrial Revolution, the entire digital age would have passed by, and your supercomputer would still be churning, not even close to finished. Aurora did it in less time than it takes to listen to your favorite song. So, why does this matter to you and me? This isn't just an academic victory lap for a handful of physicists. This is the starting pistol for a new kind of technological race. Think about the biggest, gnarliest problems facing our species. We want to cure diseases like Alzheimer's and cancer. We need to design new materials for hyper-efficient batteries to combat climate change. We need to build financial models that can predict and prevent economic collapse. These problems are all, at their core, problems of staggering complexity. They involve simulating how molecules fold, how atoms interact, or how millions of variables influence each other. Our current computers, for all their power, have to take shortcuts. They have to approximate. They can't grasp the full, intricate dance of reality at its most fundamental level. Zanadu's breakthrough is the first tangible proof that we are building a tool that can. It's a signal that we're moving from an era of processing information to an era of understanding reality. And the most shocking part? This revolution is being powered by the most familiar and fundamental force in our lives, light. To truly appreciate why light is such a game changer, you have to understand the alternative. For years, the titans of the tech world Google, IBM, and others have been building quantum computers using something called superconducting qubits. Imagine a microscopic electronic circuit, so exquisitely sensitive that it must be kept in an environment colder than the vacuum of deep space. We're talking temperatures near absolute zero, just a hair's breadth above the point where all atomic motion ceases. These systems are housed in enormous, multi-million dollar dilution refrigerators. Picture a set of Russian nesting dolls the size of a car with layers of gold-plated shielding, all humming away with an army of pumps and cryogenic fluids. Their purpose? To isolate the qubits from the chaos of our world. A single stray vibration from a passing truck, a tiny fluctuation in temperature, or even a lone cosmic ray from a distant exploding star can be enough to knock the qubit out of its delicate quantum state, creating an error and ruining the entire computation. This is known as decoherence. It's the arch nemesis of quantum computing. Scaling this technology up to the millions of qubits needed for a true data center is, as the article so brilliantly put it, like trying to build a skyscraper out of ice cubes in the middle of the Sahara. It's an engineering nightmare. Now, let's turn to Zanadu's approach. They sidestep this entire problem by choosing photons, the fundamental particles of light, as their qubits. Photons are the Zen masters of the quantum realm. They are incredibly resilient. They don't have an electrical charge, so they barely interact with the stray electromagnetic fields that plague other systems. They are largely immune to heat and vibrations. This inherent stability means that most of Xanadu's Aurora computer can operate at a comfortable room temperature. No giant freezers, no cryogenic fortress. This alone shatters one of the biggest barriers to entry for quantum computing.
making it vastly more practical, energy efficient, and crucially, scalable. But the real masterstroke of using photons is their native ability to network. How does the internet get to your house? For most of us, it's through fiber optic cables, glass threads carrying information encoded as pulses of light. Photonic quantum computers speak this language fluently. You can connect one photonic quantum processor to another using the exact same off-the-shelf fiber optic technology that already crisscrosses our planet. For superconducting systems, linking two quantum chips is a monumental task. It requires creating complex, fragile, and often custom-built quantum interconnects. It's like trying to get two people who speak completely different, dead languages to have a seamless conversation. Photons, on the other hand, are like universal translators. They can zip between processors, between server racks, and one day, between entire data centers, creating a vast interconnected quantum network. This isn't just an upgrade. It's a paradigm shift from building isolated, monolithic quantum machines to creating a distributed network quantum cloud. That is the blueprint for the world's first quantum data centers. So how do you actually compute with a beam of light? It sounds like magic, but it's a process of remarkable elegance. Let's walk through it. It all begins with a workhorse you're already familiar with, a laser. The laser generates precise pulses of light. These aren't just any old flashes. They are meticulously crafted to be the raw material for the qubits. Next, these light pulses are directed into a tiny, custom-designed chip. On this chip are microscopic structures called ring resonators. This is where Zanadu's secret sauce comes into play. As a pulse of light enters one of these rings, it's transformed into a special quantum state known as a squeeze state. To understand this, think of a standard qubit as a coin flip that can be heads, one, tails, zero, or a superposition of both. A squeeze state is more like a sophisticated dimmer switch. Instead of just on or off, it can exist in a superposition of multiple light levels simultaneously, for example, a state that is both two photons and six photons and ten photons at the same time. This gives the qubit more richness, more complexity, and more computational power. It's the difference between a single musical note and a rich, complex chord. Once these squeeze states are created, the real quantum magic begins. The light pulses are sent through a network of beam splitters and phase shifters on the chip. A beam splitter is like a semi-transparent mirror. It can let a photon pass through or reflect it. When multiple squeeze light beams meet at these crossroads, their quantum wave functions interfere with each other. This interference is what allows them to become entangled. Entanglement is the phenomenon Einstein famously called spooky action at a distance. It's where two or more quantum particles become fundamentally linked. Their fates are intertwined. If you measure a property of one particle, you instantly know the corresponding property of the other, no matter how far apart they are. In Zenadu's machine, this entanglement happens on a massive scale, creating a complex, high-dimensional web of interconnected possibilities. This web is where the problem is encoded. Finally, at the end of this intricate optical maze, the light is measured by hypersensitive photodetectors. These detectors don't just see light. They can count individual photons. This act of measurement is not a passive observation. It is the final step of the computation itself. The moment the photons are measured, their vast web of possibilities collapses into a single definite outcome, a pattern of numbers. This pattern is the answer to complex problem that was posed. It's a process of preparing a complex quantum state letting it evolve and interfere with itself, and then measuring the result. It's elegant, it's powerful, and because it's built on light and fiber, it's scalable. This brings us to the star of the show, Aurora. The name is no accident. Just as the Aurora Borealis is a breathtaking display of light in the sky, Zanadu's Aurora is a machine that performs its magic with light. It isn't a single, monolithic box. It's a modular system of four server racks, all seamlessly connected by fiber optics. 
One rack is the master controller, generating the pristine laser light. The other three are the quantum processing units, each a powerful quantum computer in its own right, working in concert. When I had the chance to hear from Dr. Christian Weebrook, Zanadu's founder and CEO, his words resonated with the gravity of the moment. He emphasized that this wasn't just about building one powerful machine, but about creating a new architecture. Each server rack is an individual quantum computer, connected by fiber optics, he said. This modularity is key. To make Aurora more powerful, you don't have to rebuild the entire thing. You just add more racks. You plug them in. This is the vision, a future where quantum data centers, the size of a small college campus, are built by linking thousands of these server racks together. Zendu has set an ambitious goal to reach this scale by 2029. But they are also realists. Their biggest immediate challenge is what's known as optical loss. In any light-based system, some photons will inevitably get lost along the way absorbed by the material of the chip or scattered away. Each lost photon is a tiny bit of lost quantum information. Too much loss and the system's quantum advantage fades. That's why Zandu has declared 2025 the year of loss reduction. This isn't a sign of failure. It's a sign of maturity. They've proven the physics works. Now comes the hard engineering work of refining the system, plugging the leaks, and turning a record breaking experiment into a reliable, fault tolerant tool. As someone who has spent the last decade of my life designing classical computer chips, this story hits me on a deeply personal level. I've been on the front lines of Moore's Law, the principle that has driven the tech industry for 50 years. I've seen the incredible ingenuity that goes into shrinking transistors and cramming more power onto a single piece of silicon. But I've also seen the writing on the wall. We're reaching the physical limits of what silicon can do. The improvements are becoming linear, incremental, while the demand for computational power driven by the AI revolution is exploding exponentially. We're asking our computers to do more and more, but the tools we're using are hitting a fundamental ceiling. Photonic quantum computing feels like someone just handed us a ladder to climb over that wall. What excites me most is the democratization of this power. You won't need to buy a multi-million dollar quantum computer. You'll access it through the cloud. Imagine a future where any researcher, any startup, any student with a brilliant idea can log into a quantum cloud service and run simulations that were previously impossible. That's how true revolutions happen, not when technology is confined to elite labs, but when it's put into the hands of millions of creative minds. On a much smaller, personal scale, it reminds me of the importance of having the right tools. I recently invested in a high-quality ergonomic chair for my workspace, a Sihu chair to be exact. It seems like a minor thing, but the effect on my focus and productivity was immediate and profound. I was no longer fighting my environment. I was supported by it. That's what Xanadu is doing for computation. They're building a tool that doesn't fight the laws of nature, but embraces them. It's a reminder that progress often comes not from brute force, but from finding a more elegant, more natural way of working. This is a lesson we can all apply in our own lives. We all have superconducting qubit problems, those stubborn challenges, where we're trying to force a solution with brute strength, getting frustrated by the constant setbacks and the enormous effort required. Maybe it's a career path that feels like an uphill battle, a creative project that is stalled, or a personal goal that seems impossibly far away. The story of Xanadu asks us to consider. What is our photonic approach? What if, instead of pushing harder, we look for a different way in? A simpler, more elegant solution that works with the nature of the problem, not against it. It's about having the courage to step off the well-trodden path and embrace a new perspective. The future doesn't belong to those who do the same thing better. It belongs to those who see a completely new way of doing things. So I want to ask you, what is one problem in your life that could benefit from a new kind of light? What's an obstacle you've been facing where a completely different approach might unlock a solution you've never considered? 
I would genuinely love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. What part of this quantum future excites you the most? And how do you believe it will change our world? Thank you for coming along on this incredible journey into the future of computing. If this story lit a spark of curiosity in you, please hit that subscribe button and join our community. We're all about exploring the frontiers of science and technology and understanding what they mean for us. Share this with a friend who loves to geek out about the future.